Welcome, sports fans. It's that time again. I'm your host, Charles E. Smith, Jr., alongside Rockin' Robin Kirk, and it is time for... Inside Sports, changing the world one sport at a time. And because... That's how we roll. That is how we roll. And, of course, you know, everybody knows that uh, myself and Rockin' Robin, we've just been doing the show. It's just our second show here. It's time. We got you sworn in last time. But, you know, I was negotiating deep into the night with her agent. She wanted a, I believe it was a $4.5 million signing bonus, if I'm right. Yeah, I wanted a lot of it guaranteed. Yeah, you did. So it was a little bit, uh, you know, because we got a little budget constraints here at Inside Sports. So it wasn't quite what I was figuring. So we went back and forth. There were some ethnic slurs. We talked about each other's ancestry a little bit. But ultimately, I think you, myself, and your agent bonded. So I've got your (laughs) signing bonus right here I'm going to present to you. Oh, very nice. I thought the bonus, you know, had had to be dropped. Because oh. I wanted so much guaranteed money. Yeah, here's your here's your signing bonus right here. Oh yeah. That's your signing bonus. So instead of normally, you know, going out for a drink, we got your signing bonus right here. All right. This is for you. And this is your signing signing bonus and your first uh, your salary for the first ten shows okay. as well. <laughs> uh, I think your agent did a great job of negotiating. I don't know how you feel about it, but uh, there you go. You that's- know, my agent knew that once I had this, I would forget all about. What happened with the negotiations I, I breaking heard some down? Things. Yeah, I heard some things. Yeah, and I was going to bring you a, I was going to give you a margarita recipe also, but from what I understand, whether you have the recipe or not, this bottle is have, going to have a rather short lifespan. I'm just saying that's yeah, just I, what I, I heard. I, I could see that happening. <laughs> yeah, there may not even be time to mix in the the, the sugary margarita mix. <laughs> the sweet and sour may or not may not happen. But. <laughs> Anyway, you enjoy, and it's an honor and a privilege to have you join Inside Sports. Oh, thank you, Charles. I'm really happy to be here. I'm very excited. This is an awesome show, and I think we're going to do some good work together. All right. Well, let's get right into it. Of course, this past week, the NHL is in the offseason, but we're here in Southern California where the Los Angeles Kings are coming to the forefront with all the moves that they have made, uh, namely signing Mike Richards, uh, signing Simone Gagne. They're going to be reunited as they were in uh, Philadelphia. Yeah for all those years. With Got a Terry Murray. To, exactly, with Terry Murray, with Looking John good. Stevens. Mm-hmm. They just, yep. And then when you go through the, the Philadelphia flavor that is now in the, in the Kings front office is really evident as well. Dean Lombardi worked for the, for the Flyers. Of course, Ron Hextall was their goaltender back then. He has Flyer roots. So this has kind of become uh, Philly West. Yeah, here. exactly. I like it. I think the Kings are really shaping up nicely, looking good on paper. Hopefully that will translate over to w's when the season starts but um right now looking really good and mike richards is settling in nicely he's starting to really warm up he's really happy to be here so everything's looking good exactly we did an excuse exclusive interview with inside sports uh and mike richards this past uh, just this past wednesday we'll have that up on the site at officialinsidesports.com very very soon probably be up on monday so everybody all you kings fans and hockey fans as well you want to meet Mike Richards. What I like about him is not just his skill level, but what he brings to the table as far as just the, the work ethic, mm-hmm. which is what the Kings are going to need if they're going to get past the toughest teams in the West. Because, of course, uh, you look at the San Jose's of the world, the Vancouver's of the world, they're strong in the middle. With their, uh, If you look at their top two centers, you got the Sedins, you got Ryan Kessler mm-hmm. in, in Vancouver, and then you go to San Jose, and you, know, you choose a Joe Thornton, Patrick Marlowe, uh, Joe Pavelski, Logan Couture, all those guys up the middle. They're going to need Mike Richards to be that second really, really shut down guy. Yeah. And also to put that pressure on. And I think that's what the Kings need just to be strong up the middle like that. Yeah, especially with Kopitar coming back after the injury. It's going to be nice to have Richards there. That's mm-hmm. kind of the one-two punch for the Kings. Right. And from what I understand, Andre Kopitar, he's ahead of schedule as far as his rehab goes. So he's going to be mm-hmm. chomping at the bit. He's going to be ready to play. He went down late last season. And now I just like, I haven't been this excited about the Kings, honestly, since 1988. All right. When, <laughs> when Robin, I think, was still in high school. <laughs> when Wayne Gretzky came to town in August of That's 1998, right. that was the last time I felt this optimistic and just looking forward this much to the, uh, the L.A. Kings upcoming season. Yeah, definitely. And Mike Richards said he's really excited to be on the other side of uh of the kings you know of playing the kings being in 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 the, with the kings this time and feeling the energy of the arena that it's always such a great arena such a great fan base so he's really happy to be here mm-hmm. it's exciting 
Fantastic. And of course, Simone Gagne, he's reunited with him. Yep. Let's go ahead and move down. We've got another team here in the Southland, of course, the Anaheim Ducks. And maybe not the depth of the Kings, but when you look at the Ducks, it's hard to find a better first line than what they have. Uh, Ryan Getzloff centering mm -hmm. Corey Perry and, and Bobby Ryan. Corey Perry, of course, the reigning MVP of yes. the National Hockey League. Yes. He had a fantastic season last year, and uh, he's really excited to to get going again. He's got some, some great help. And uh, they're also their rookies are looking really good, too. Got, got a chance to see some of their rookies and got a good bunch. All right. Well, I do worry about them a little bit. They've got their, their grinders. They've got their hard workers. When I look at their second line, though, and uh, Saku Koivu, Jason Blake, Tamu Solani. Solani is 41 years old mm -hmm. now. Jason Blake and Saku Koivu are not getting any younger. So maybe it's time to if we can get some more guys up there as far as in Anaheim just to – some more second line type players mm -hmm. because how long can that line stay together and not to take anything away from them, they're great hockey players but father time <laughs> he is a relentless predator and he is hunting us all yep and speaking of 40 well, everyone but you 40 year olds oh I'm, I'm timeless <laughs> i'm timeless um speaking of players in the 40 year range chris draper worth mentioning he retired he's officially retired he's going to go mm -hmm. work in the front office for the red wings uh, but he had a fantastic, am really amazing career, four cups uh, with the Red Wings, and uh, it'll be interesting to watch him take over kind of behind the scenes now, see what he does for the Red Wings in Detroit. Exactly. And the other thing is with, with uh, Chris Draper, he's one of those guys who he's not going to be in the Hall of Fame. He's not that type of a player. Mm -hmm. But it's almost like the Hall of Fame should have a wing for certain players who maybe are not in the <laughs> Hall, but... They should the uh, could the Hall of Fame have an honorable mention category? Yeah, could it or could it be like the window of yeah. fame, like you almost got in but you're right. not quite there, but maybe they just have a special window. They don't give you a, they don't give you a bust, but they give you maybe a lithograph of your face yeah. in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> exactly. He should be in there along with guys like uh, like Steve Thomas, guys like that who are just tough, gritty hockey players who were the epitome of what you should be as a player, but you know they just weren't the Hall of Fame type. Right, just aren't quite that caliber. Right, but yeah. then again, when you look at the Hall of Fame, Clark Gillies is in there, so maybe Chris Draper will get in as well. I can't believe Adam Oates is not in the Hall of Fame. You know what, I could go on that subject forever because a few of the leagues, they've all got uh, some borderline Hall of Famers in there who you think once these guys in get in, it opens up kind of a floodgate for some other guys who were on that level as well. Right, right. You know, I think they have to draw that line and just keep it really, really the elite players get in. Otherwise, it could get a little gray. Right. Exacto mundo. So, let's move on from the ice to the gridiron. Ooh, here we go. Well, the CBA was signed this week. Everybody agreed. That stands for Collective Bargaining Agreement. Yes, it does. In case you're not familiar with all the terminology. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, and boy, the teams got right to it. It actually was really exciting after they signed it because you normally have this period where things happen really slowly. Well, things happened really quickly and we'll catch you up on some of the big trades that went down this week. Yeah, big trades, uh, free agent signings, namely everybody who knows me, you know, I like the, I like my Miami Dolphins. I like the Steelers as well. Steelers are my, they're like one and one A. You I root for the Steelers if they're, playing, if they're playing anyone but the Dolphins, I'll root for the Steelers. Okay, <laughs> so all right. That's pretty so much what up? it comes down to. Like with Burris, he met with the Steelers today. Eh, he did. I'm, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about Flex. <laughs> I don't know about Flex Burris. You remember, he left Pittsburgh. He was kind of, he was getting in a little bit of trouble, uh, kind of under the radar there in Pittsburgh when he left. Not anything truly, truly bad, but just yeah, a little bit of, mm, Pseudo miscreant behavior, mm -hmm. shall we call it? Yeah. Then he left. But you know, a lot of players though they leave for their paydays, and then they wind up coming back to the Steelers. Uh, Antoine Randall is a good a good example mm. of that. But the Steelers are a great organization, and that's the thing. And that's why I, when I look at my whole roots with with football, I go back to the Steelers, the Dolphins of the 70s, mm -hmm. and the team that is really still the same team that I grew up with is the Steelers. They still have the Roonies, there's a Rooney in charge, and they still have that Steelers mentality. Honestly, all that's left of the Dolphins that I grew up with is the logo. Oh. <laughs> that's it. The ownership has changed. The whole the whole landscape of that team has changed. They're just not the same team. But you know what? Back when I was a kid, 
you chose one team and you stuck with them to the end. And that's the way I am. I'll be a Dolphins fan uh, all the way to the end. Not like these kids nowadays where every time a team wins a Super Bowl, they go out and buy a whole new wardrobe. Well, yeah, and kids these days are really loyal to players, it seems like. Um, I don't know if it has to do with the fantasy leagues coming up. It seems to me like um, kids, I've got nephews, and they're really loyal to players, and they get really into the guys more well, than the team. You know, I think that, that brings up a good point, and that is free agency. Because when I was when I was coming up, it was you had these franchise type players, not talking about the franchise tag, so to speak, but franchise players, mm -hmm. guys that got your team. You knew they were going to be there forever until maybe they were older and then went on to mentor some younger players on another team. Mm -hmm. But they were just going to be there. Now you don't have that. No matter what kind of a, a star player you are, at any point you may wind up on another team. Mm -hmm. And to that end, I have a friend of mine who is a very big uh, Green Bay Packers fan. She's going to get a Quay Matthews jersey, but she's going to get it with just the number <laughs> and not the name on it. So maybe that's where we're headed. <laughs> Those jerseys are expensive. I mean, boy, you I pay know. $150 for a jersey, and then all of a sudden the guy gets traded, and there you are stuck with a jersey. So maybe that's where we go as far as fans. Just get it. There's a player you like. Get the jersey with the number and no name on it because, you know, the names can change. Yeah, and you need to uh, remember, choose your jersey wisely, <laughs> if at all possible. Or just go with Legends. <laughs> go, just go with Legends. That's yeah. the way to do it. I have a yeah. Dan Marino jersey, and I also have a, uh, a Ronnie Brown jersey. Ronnie Brown, I think, is going to be – he's pretty much a Dolphin for life, so I think that was a good choice. I kind of got lucky there. Uh, he's, I hope they hang on to him, but – if not, I've got my Dan Marino jersey. That one's timeless. And for the Steelers, I've got a Jack Lambert jersey from back oh, in the day. All right. The best middle linebacker ever. <laughs> ever. You hear that, Mike Singletary? The best middle linebacker ever. You hear that, Ray Lewis? Well, Ooh, maybe not it. Ray Lewis. But if, it's, if any, it's only Ray Lewis who is better than Jack Lambert, who played at only 215 pounds. But he was just mean and nasty as hell. Wow. In your face. Number 58. There we go. Uh, I actually have a Mike Madonna jersey. And I will say. <laughs> Number nine. Served me well over the years <laughs> until last season. But you now he's back in Dallas. You know, he, he still lives there. So we're going to see if he officially is going to retire or not. But, you know, yeah. the Madonna jersey served me well. Yeah, Madonna, he's a, he's a star. Yeah. I mean, I mean that in both ways. He's a Dallas star and he's a superstar. And he's soon to be a Hall of Famer as soon as he's eligible. But oh, yeah. that's one of those Absolutely. things where it was to the end of the career. He still wanted to play another year. The stars are moving forward. So it gets into that sticky situation. They just didn't offer him a contract is what mm -hmm. happened. That's what mm -hmm. Neuendijk said. So it doesn't go on to Madonna being a bad guy and leaving the team or anything. They just said, hey, we're not going to offer him a contract, meaning if you want to play another year or two, go ahead. But we're moving in another mm -hmm. direction. So hey, no hard feelings. Right. And they were very upfront with him about that. You know, they, he knew that they were – they wanted to get younger guys out there, and so it was a good opportunity for him to go have that mm -hmm. one year in Detroit, even though he was riddled with injuries almost the entire season. Right. Um, but, you know, he's, he's from Detroit, and he said it was a pleasure to be able to see his parents twice a week and hang out with his friends and family and play in front of them. So, you know, that, that was a good, I think that was a good move for him. Absolutely. And like I talk about father time, you know, the same thing with Joe Sackett when he was at the end of his career in Colorado and just kind of hanging on. It's that painful time that we as uh, as sports fans have to see you know, Wayne Gretzky wearing cement skates when he was skating for the mm -hmm. uh, New York Rangers. And was he did he actually play for St. Louis? I don't think that really happened. Uh, Gretzky, he played for Edmonton and he played for Los Angeles. That's that's it. That's what I remember of Wayne Gretzky. I refuse to acknowledge anything else. There are rumors in football. There's rumors that Emmett Smith played for the Cardinals, but I don't accept uh, that. That's that didn't folklore. happen, did it? It didn't that, happen. That's right. wives' tale. Does anyone have any, any, any video happen. of it? <laughs> no, no. He did not play for the Cardinals. It, it, it didn't happen. I refuse to accept it. Where did you find that? In, like, the Internet archives? I think Just, it was like, on old, Deadspin or Old something. and untrue or something? I think it was on Deadspin. <laughs> One of those unconfirmed uh, websites. They said Emma Smith as a cardinal. I don't know. I think it was photoshopped. I, well, it must have been. Yeah. Had to be. Well, speaking of uh, retired players trying to make a comeback, maybe we should touch on Tiki Barber. Find it interesting. Eli Manning said he would much rather play with Mexico Burris over Tiki Barber. So I guess you take the criminal over the adulterer. Well, is that it, what we're saying? <laughs> I think I'll say this for Plexico Burris. Just remember, he's more of a knucklehead than a criminal because yeah. he just. I don't know why you'd have a loaded gun 
And anyone who knows anything about handguns, he not only had the gun loaded, but he had the gun loaded with a round in the chamber, the gun cocked, and the safety off. What was he expecting when he walked into that nightclub? Even if you're going to carry a gun, which I don't recommend, still, <laughs> the main thing is you've got to have the safety on the gun. And if not, why would you have a round in the chamber? I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. He, he, you know, I hate to say it, but he did dodge a bullet with how that came out because somebody could have been killed. Yeah. You know, for how how lax he was with his gun. Yeah, that either night. that or he could have shot himself through the sack if he wasn't, yeah, exactly. if he wasn't careful. <laughs> Game over. <laughs> oh, he's already got a couple of kids, so I guess it wouldn't matter. Oh, he's off that. <laughs> and speaking of a couple of kids, you know, over in the, in the uh, other side of New York, there, the New York Jets. They were supposed to get, you know, their, her whole thing was getting to the Super Bowl. Darrell Rivas, Rivas mm -hmm. Island, Antonio Cromartie on the, on the right side. Cromartie, he's left the Eagles, or excuse me, the, the Jets now. So, speaking of kids, as you know, he's got, I think it's six kids by five women in oh four different states. Wait, is this the NBA or the... And no, not Sean Kemp. Talking about. Not Sean Kemp. Hmm. <laughs> but he does get the Sean Kemp the Pimp Award. Wow. For baby mamas how out many, there. How many does Sean Kemp have? Uh, it's around eight or nine. They're confirmed. Oh then there's some gosh. rumors. Rumors out there. Jeez. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You don't have one of Sean Kemp's kids, do you? Not that I've been notified yet. <laughs> nope. Okay. Well, you know, and one other thing. There's an elephant in the room, and not you, not you, but an elephant in the room <laughs> in the NFL. And that is when I, I talk about the marketing of the NFL. And there was a time when they looked at players and really you got, they talked about players in an honest manner. Now it's more about promoting players and promoting the game as though a player is a star all the time. Just to have people watch, they, they hype it up. Donovan McNabb is one. And the other is Peyton Manning. Now, let's touch on McNabb first. They talk about McNabb. He's going to the Vikings now, getting veteran leadership all these years, all this experience. Did anyone watch McNabb play last year? Did anyone see that? Anyone? <laughs> what did the Redskins win? Five games? I saw games? him on the bench. I saw him heading to the bench. Right. They played, the they, they won five games last year? And McNabb was benched for three games? Yeah. And then he goes to the Vikings, and they talk about that as though they're getting a good deal? Well, please, please. The Eagles sent him to a division rival. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a plan to sink the Redskins, is what they did. They sunk a division rival by giving him their uh, lame duck quarterback. Mm -hmm. So that's it with McNabb. Now, the other, we got to address it. And, you know, even though I think he, he's a heck of a nice guy, he's talented as all hell, but Peyton Manning. At some point, he's got to be held accountable for all these playoff failures. And he's not on a weak team where they're getting in at maybe nine and seven or or ten and six last week of this season. He's winning twelve, thirteen, fourteen. They won fifteen games a couple of seasons ago, mm -hmm. but they're winning all the time. He's got the team to win. They get in the playoffs and he's going belly up. Two thousand seven, he gets outdueled by Philip Rivers at home. Philip Rivers is on one leg, still beats him. The Super Bowl, he throws a pick six, the most egregious pick six. In the history of Super Bowl, and I watched, I watched Neil O'Donnell play in the Super Bowl, so I've seen some bad quarterbacking. But he's got one ring, and what happened with that one ring, when they finally got there, all he did was hand the ball off to Joseph Adai and Dominique Rose, and then he goes and picks up the MVP trophy somehow. And then even last season, against Mark Sanchez, he can't get it done again. Mm -hmm. Manning, a good regular season, great regular season quarterback. But when the chips are down, and you really need to stop him, he cannot get it done in the playoffs. And that's where you really make your name is in the playoffs. It's one thing to be on a good team, but you've got to get it done when it counts. And all the evidence is pointing to Peyton Manning not getting it done. He has a sub-500 playoff record. In fact, he has the worst playoff winning percentage of any Super Bowl winning quarterback wow. in history. And I'm including Trent Dilfer, Brad Johnson, and Mark Rippon. In history. In history, wow. yes. Wow. Why isn't that ever talked about? So his perception is different than his reality. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And perception can be reality if you don't watch shows like this where we bring it to you straight. <laughs> because the NFL, they're not, they're not paying me. They're not paying me to uh, hype up somebody like Peyton Manning 
just like you got the hype machine that's going to go this year for the Eagles mm -hmm. because they landed uh, the prize free agent cornerback. Yeah. Who was? Asamoah. Awesome. Say it again. Asamoah. Awesome. First name? Uh, n how do you pronounce it? N n Nagni. <laughs> <laughs> Namdi Asamoah. Namdi, that's right. Right. And then they've got Asante Samuel back there. So they're stacked on defense, but I look at their other side of the ball. Am I going to get to a Super Bowl with Michael Vick? Really? No, you're going to get ESPN highlights with Michael Vick. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get to a Super Bowl with Michael Vick. One thing about the Eagles, players are very drawn to the Eagles, and a lot of it seems to be Andy Reid. What it seems, I mean, he's obviously a very talented coach. But it seems, well, my perception is that they also just want to work for him because he's a great guy. It could be. I mean, obviously, they, could be. they have to go for his talent, but there's something that seems to be about Andy Reid that people are really drawn to him, and I think it goes probably beyond his coaching. Right. Well, and that gets around because a lot of players, remember, a lot of players, they go to college together, even though they wind up on different teams, they keep them in contact. So mm -hmm. you have players for the Eagles who maybe have friends on other teams. So it gets circulated around which guys are players, coaches, so to speak, mm -hmm. and which guys are not. So I think Andy Reid does have that that type of a reputation. So people kind of want to go there. And also in this era of free agency, people kind of, uh, they say, well, I needed a change. I like this city. I like that city. You know, you look at the contract they signed, and probably that had a lot to do with oh, yeah. it. For sure. <laughs> yeah, if your city is willing to pay me ten million dollars a year, and my city only wants to pay me five million dollars a year, I might tend to like your city a little bit better. Yeah, I can read I that Liberty Bell. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can get, uh, I can get used to this. Yeah, yeah. of course, money talks. Exactly. As and we, all know. we don't have to talk about what walks, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you can take that one, Charles. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And of a, getting back to uh, quarterbacks, though, some a couple of my prove-it-to-me quarterbacks for this year, uh, Joe Flacco is one in the AFC, and Matt Ryan is the other in the NFC. We can talk about Tony Romo in just a moment here. But yeah. <laughs> Joe Flacco, the 12-4 and with the Ravens last year, and then when the chips were down, though, against the Steelers, 126 yards of total offense. I don't mean passing yards. I mean, through the air, on the ground, and everything, that 126 yards, they get whooped by the Steelers. Matt Ryan, 13-3. and three. Matty Ice, as he's called. But I have seen the ice melt. The ice does melt in big games he's in. And they go 13-3 and three last year. They get into the playoffs, get beat 48-21 to 21 at home against Green Bay. Those are two young fellows who, it's prove it to me time. We know you can win a lot of games. We know you got the talent. But do you have the strength to get it done when it counts, or are you going to wind up in Peyton Manningville? Tony Romoville. Tony Romoville. Talk to me. You're a Dallas gal, Dallas I fan. I am. I'm a you Dallas fan. You love your Mavericks. You love your Cowboys. Yes, yes, I Your do. Cowboys. And as Jerry Jones said, as a team, we stunk it up this year. Yeah, he did. Did they stink it up last year? Uh, I mean, there was a foul it, odor drifting. Yeah, I mean, it, from the suburbs. It's just kind of how the trend has been the last few years with the Cowboys. You know, they just really exciting during the regular season, and then the playoffs come and they just tank. And I think that as a quarterback, you have responsibility to to be the leader on your team. And I just think Tony Romo doesn't play with the same kind of heart and passion that some of the really great quarterbacks have over the years and I can't help but uh kind of pinpoint the team's demise to Tony Romo's kind of lack of passion mm. he it kind of they seem my perception is that they seem to be just happy to make the playoffs let's go all the way guys come on well I, I think one of the things and, and this was last year some of the former cowboy players the greats were there the from the 90s teams the Emmett Smiths and uh, of the world and Troy Aikmans and things like that. And they were saying that when it comes down to it, with this team, they like being superstars. They like the glamour. But when it comes time to really get it done and earn their money, they don't want to do it. Right. So you got to get in the trenches. It's one thing to be a glamour team, but there's a lot of dirty work that's done. Dirty, sweaty, ugly, make you sore for a week type of work. Mm -hmm. And it seems that they don't really want to do those type of things, which is what will, will put them over the, to the next level. And that's what you have to do. As the season wears on, 
you're getting more and more injured every week. And mm -hmm. but the most important games are coming up. So mm -hmm. that's the time when you really got to suck it up and get it done. And I just look at when I look at both sides of the ball. Marion Barber is one player, and then I look at Demarcus Ware on the other. Marion Barber, what? I can't even figure out what type of a runner is he. Is he a power runner? Is he a finesse runner? Uh, you know, what does he? Uh, I wish, I wish that we could. I wish we had an do? ability to see what a player could do if they weren't <laughs> injured, because you know, probably about well, three or four years ago, exactly? the, co the cover of Sports Illustrated said the scariest place to be for a defender is between the 10-yard line and the touchdown, and Marion Barber's got the ball. So right. he, you know, a few years ago was the force to reckon with, and he just hasn't been able to keep that up. And so, you know what? Later, you're out. You're not a cowboy anymore. Where is he going to go? I, I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we talk about running back to Tiki Barber. He was kind of that same staying within your division, but going over to the Giants, Tiki Barber was kind of that kind of running back. Mm -hmm. They talk about him making a comeback. Well, okay, you were mediocre when you were – really, he had two good seasons there for the Giants. I know mm -hmm. he set the all-time rushing record for yeah. the Giants, all that. But you got to look at the history of the Giants and see what running backs they had. So it's not as though the Giants had a running back list with Emmett Smith and Eric Dickerson and Jim Brown on their roster or anything. It was – their running attack has always been, you know, it's kind of three yards in the cloud of dust and guys have had short careers. Mm -hmm. So Barber went there, was able to stay there for a while, and he just, you know, he set those records. But just keep it in perspective. And getting back to your Cowboys, though, Tony Romo, one side. But on the other side, I look at DeMarcus Ware, and I've, I've defended him to people many times because I think he's a great player. He's a very, very talented player. But... You know, they say he puts up a lot of his stats when it doesn't really matter. And I would like to see DeMarcus Ware, honestly, start having some bigger games in bigger moments and anchor that defense. I don't think he's, he's – he's established himself as the best player on that side of the ball, but to really take hold and anchor and say, you know what, this is my defense. It's about me, my boys back here. And if you want to get down the field, you're going to have to go through this. That type mm -hmm, of a thing is mm -hmm. like I'd, I'd like to see from DeMarcus Ware. And that's – what I haven't really seen from him yet. So you think that he shares all the responsibility for the team being soft? Well, or you someone, think part of the, like he's the leader of the defense? So, you know. He's the biggest, baddest dude on that side of the ball. Yeah. So as that, he's got to anchor that defense and get his, his personality spread out through that defense, get his linebackers playing hard, get his DBs playing hard, and say, you know what, if the defense is bad, if anything happens, I want it on my shoulders, that type of thing. That's where you get from a, a captain. It's mm -hmm. about being a, a leader on and off the field and the one who accepts all that accountability. And when you look at the great team throughout the years, they had anchors. We go back to, you know, like I said, a Steelers fan. Go back to the Steelers. Joe Green anchored that defensive line. Then you had Ham and Lambert anchoring those linebackers. You have Mel Blunt in that defensive backfield. And those were the guys who accepted that accountability. And we're just willing to say, you know, don't you're not getting past this point. The buck stops here. And if you were lucky enough to get past Joe Green and his lineman, you had Jack Lambert and Jack Ham just waiting to uh, make you one with the turf. Mm -hmm. So that's the attitude I'd like to see filtered through that Dallas defense, as opposed to the glamour, the billion-dollar stadium, mm -hmm. the America's team. That's all well and good, but still, football is football. No matter what the right. what the advertising campaign is, football is football. And you got to do some dirty, ugly work, and you got to do a lot of stuff that's not fun if you're going to be successful. Yeah, exactly. And it's true. I mean, I grew up in Dallas, and the players are treated like what? they are. They are the they are the big celebrities in that city, and so I think you know the players get caught up in it, and it's time to take it back to the field and prove in 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 your win column that you have what it takes. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Let's get ready to wrap things up here. Just a few other things you, you might want. You know what? Detroit Lions. I, I don't normally talk about the Lions unless there's a punchline at the end of it. But I look at the Detroit Lions, hey, Domicon Sue on the front line, and now Nick Fairley out of Auburn, mm -hmm. who was a beast. Nick Fairley, and I know it's a different level than at the college level, but he was really responsible for Auburn beating us, beating Oregon in that, in that championship game. They could not get him blocked all day. He's a beast. And if they come in with bookends like Dama Kong Su and Nick Fairley, 
hey, the Lions are going to be nothing nice on defense. It's going to be really tough to move the ball against them. But they're going to have to also they have to make move their the ball offense. Themselves. Yeah, they've got to do some things on offense, obviously. And if Matt Stafford can stay healthy for more than a game and a half at a time, <laughs> then maybe, just maybe, they can do something. It's Calvin Johnson is a great receiver. Uh, Megatron, yep. as he's called. Great receiver, but still, they need a, a quarterback and – that's, you know, that's it. Like I said, when yeah. I drafted Matt Stafford, uh, the GM said, well, I think it's about time we, we replace Bobby Lane. Wow. <laughs> look, at the, look at the quarterbacks over the year. They've been horrible. I know, I know. They have been horrible. So we always go a half hour here. We're just about done. Rock and Robin. What do you anything to say to the fans here? Well, I'm really excited about the upcoming season. Uh, we're ready for the, the NFL to get going. We also... We're going to touch on college ball, but we run out of time. So maybe the next college show, ball. We'll talk I was about at, some Pac-12. Well, right. I was at Pac-12 Media today, Media Day, and you know, talked with USC, UCLA, also uh, Oregon, Oregon State, Washington, Washington State, new teams, uh, mm -hmm. Utah and Colorado. Yeah. We interviewed some of the players and coaches. We'll have that available on officialinsidesports.com, and also we'll talk about that as their season uh, draws nigh. So we're, we're keeping everyone on the edge, uh, whether it be hockey, whether it be NFL, whether it be the NCAA football. We'll even talk. There used to be a basketball league called the NBA, and <laughs> there's a your, your Dallas Mavericks won a championship, and then they just the whole league just rode off into the sunset. Yeah, I think that's going to get ugly. That when I look at the cuts they want to have made, and that is the owners wanting a a hard cap, the amount of salary they want to trim off the whole thing, trimming that amount of fat off. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be really, uh, it could get long, drawn out, and ugly. And we'll have less of the than the 50-game season we had in the 98-99 mm -hmm. season. So yeah, it could get ugly. Yeah, part right now. So they've got some work to do. And it doesn't help. I wonder if it helps or doesn't help that a lot of players already were making plans to go play in Europe when they saw this coming. Mm -hmm. been, there's players that are playing for two or three years. Because they knew that nothing was going to get done, so they're making deals to go play in Europe while this lockout is happening. And I'd say with a player, as a player, it makes a strike or a lockout a lot more palatable if you can go ahead and make uh, $3 million a year while you're unemployed. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Take that every day of the yeah. week. Working on your skills, not getting rusty. Exactly. Making money. I mean, and being treated like absolute royalty over there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Definitely. I mean, those guys know. They're much more marketable when they come back, too, if they've stayed in the loop. Kept playing. Exactly, Mundo. All right, everybody. So that's it from here in our lavish inside sports studio. <laughs> I can see the uh, champagne and caviar over there, the strawberries. And is that a lobster tail? Yeah, yeah. It is, yeah. Our maitre right. d' is holding our lobster tail over there, All getting right. ready to serve us. Very good, very good. All right, everybody. <laughs> I'm Charles E. Smith, Jr., this is Robin Kirk, a.k.a. Sea Dog and Rockin' Robin. The show, of course, is... Inside Sports, changing right. the world one sport at a time. Because... That's how we roll. We'll see you all next week. Bye.